Very good afternoon to all of you once again. I'm ever so thankful that you all could join me. We left off in 1 Kings chapter 7 with our Bible study, and Solomon has just completed the temple. Very important. you got to kind of line up the time here as to when he completes it and when he is now dedicating it. We'll come to that. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the chief of the fathers of the children of Israel, unto King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. This graph right here easily lays this out for us to see what is meant by bringing the Ark out of the city of David. Jerusalem, city of David on the eastern ridge. It was the old ancient core. Right on up here would be the temple on Mount Moriah, so they brought it out of this place, and it's assumed that there was a second tabernacle that David had built. The other one is in Gibeon, and all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the, in the month Ethenum, which is the seventh month. One can read in 1 Kings 6, verse 38, about how the temple was finished in the eighth month. But we see him dedicating it in the seventh month. Did he dedicate it early? No, he waited 11 months before dedicating it for a few good reasons. One was that the people would be gathered together for the Feast of Tabernacles at this time. So the people would already be in Jerusalem. This was going to be the most grand spectacle that they had probably ever seen. Up until this time, this would have been an amazing sight. Like the Super Bowl times a million. The Super Bowl happens once a year. This was a once <laughs> a once in a lifetime thing for these for these people. So the first reason for this eleven month waiting period is for the Feast of Tabernacles. The second is for convenience, as this would have been after the harvest. They would have already have had their crops and this would have not put anyone out really this would have been an easy to meet up time of the year and number three it may have been the year of jubilee some believe which is a after 50 years in all of israel the nation of israel it was commanded that there would be a year of jubilee and it would be basically like hitting the reset button this would have kept the land within the families the debts that the israelites owed one another would have been canceled their servants would have been freed on this year of jubilee and it is believed that solomon may have waited sp specifically for this year of jubilee and all the elders of israel came and the priests took up the ark if you'll remember how david they put the ark on a carriage of sorts and had oxen carry it. And Uzzah died from touching it, trying to stabilize it. It almost fell over. So it seems like Solomon, they have learned by this point, the priests are to carry the ark. That's how it's always meant to be. And the ark of the covenant was the most important piece in the temple. So this would have been just, a, oh man, what a, what a sight. And they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even though even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be told nor numbered for multitude. And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place into the oracle of the house to the most holy place this would have been the holy of holies in the back of the temple even under the wings of the cherubim now there were cherubim already on the lid of the ark of the covenant but apparently there were these massive other cherubim that were built within the temple and they would have that's probably proportionately correct for the cherubim spread forth their two wings over the place of the ark and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof above now the staves simply mean these the rods that they used to carry them and they drew out the staves that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the oracle and they were not seen without meaning outside
Now here's quite a unique verse in itself. There was nothing in the ark save the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. These would have been the Ten Commandments. We don't know what happened to Aaron's rod that budded, nor the golden cup of uh, manna that was also in it. There were three items in it, and now we only see the Ten Commandments. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Now this was the glory of God coming down. And this so often happened, it happened at Mount Sinai, how this thick cloud comes down and it's accompanied with fire, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. And God is a consuming fire. But this is simply the glory of God showing itself within the temple. This would have been a... Uh, kind of a frightening sight. Even the priests themselves ran out of the temple. Now we're told about in the Bible how the glory of the Lord is manifested as a cloud quite often, but also other elements such as fire, as the burning bush, and then uh, wind, like um, the day of Pentecost. And then... It's a still, small voice where he speaks to Elijah. And also thunder. If you'll recall how many would, whenever God spoke from heaven, it sounded like thunder. And all the people would fall to their faces. It would be so loud. But also take note how it's not only these priests that are frightened of it. I'm assuming that they're frightened they actually ran out of the temple. And Solomon and the rest of the congregation, no on how many Israelites are there, it probably packed all of Jerusalem. But not only were these priests frightened of this presence of the Lord appearing within the temple in this thick cloud, but throughout the scriptures we read about how people feared these manifestations. Moses feared at the burning bush and... Uh, uh, Peter, James, and John at the Mount of Transfiguration, they were terrified. John in the book of Revelation, he's very, very frightened. He's so frightened, as a matter of fact, when he sees Jesus, that he falls like a dead man. He One gets the sense that he just passes out. He has no strength within him. But also, a really unique one is that of Isaiah 6. Isaiah, he sees this vision of the Lord in the year that Uzziah died, King Uzziah, he sees this vision of the Lord. Now, this would happen hundreds of years after what we're discussing discussing right now. But the prophet Isaiah, he would see this vision, and he would see the the Lord sitting high and lifted up in this temple, and he's speaking of Christ and how his the train of his robe, meaning his robe, fills the whole temple. Uh, that's just such a majestic verse. But he also sees these seraphim they're very unique angelic beings they're very special they fly around christ the lord himself they're flying around him and they're saying holy 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 is the lord god almighty the whole earth is filled with his glory and then we see this appear while he's seeing this and the post of the door moved at the voice of him meaning one of the seraphim that cried cried out moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So we see how smoke, clouds, wind, fire, thunder, God can use any element in order to manifest himself. But the prophet Isaiah then goes on and says this, one of the most famous verses in the entire Old Testament, Then said I, upon seeing this magnificent vision and then this smoke, then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And who do we know as the King? The King of kings is Jesus Christ, and the Lord of lords, judge of judges, blessed be his name. One other note of this glory of the Lord filling the temple is that of... What happens in Ezekiel's day, the prophet Ezekiel's day, which was about 400 years later. And it's right before they go into the Babylonian captivity. 
they've sinned against the Lord. And I'm talking about the nation of Judah, the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom has already fell. Anyway, we'll have to get into all of that. That's a whole other issue. But anyway, this glory of the Lord filling Solomon's temple remained for about 400 years. And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel, the prophet, he sees the glory departing from the temple right before they're taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Ezekiel 10, 18, then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. A very sad day, very distressing. So the glory of the Lord fills the temple and the priests run out so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Then spake Solomon, the Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built thee in house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. He gives more details on what he's meaning right here. He's not meaning that this is the house of the Lord in a very literal sense. He's in heaven. He gets into that later. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake with his mouth unto David my father, and hath his hand fulfilled it, saying. Now before we go any further, notice how the Lord has fulfilled this, what he told David, the father of Solomon. The Lord said, if you want to build me a house, then we'll, we'll build a house then. That's fine. But your son will have to be the one to do it because you're a man of war. The temple, Solomon's temple it was the, it was of the lord's will to have this temple built this was not simply to please david or any of that it was you know i may have been part of it but uh, the biggest part is how the temple it was destroyed hundreds of years later like we've already discussed it was it was then rebuilt and then torn down in about 70 AD a little bit after Christ's crucifixion and the third temple that we're looking for now plays into prophecy in the book of Daniel it speaks about the abomination of desolation and how over 2,000 days it'll be desolate and um, it this plays into prophecy this is a prophetic building I often tell people that you can really start to know that we're in the seven-year tribulation after pre-trib like my family many of you watching if you're pre-trib pre-tribulation rapture believer then you'll believe that we're already raptured that's i mean i hope we are but if you believe like me post-trib pre-wrath then you have to say well we're going to have to be looking for this rebuilding of the temple because the Antichrist does something to it. We don't know what. <clears throat> but here's the thing. Whenever the third temple of, of our time is to be built, there'll be peace talks in Israel. And if you haven't been keeping up with the news lately, you are missing out heavily on these peace talks happening in Israel. I'm actually planning maybe to do a video on this to give further detail because this has to be known. Israel and the United Arab Emirates just struck a historic peace deal. It's a big win for Trump. A lot of details remain to be worked out, but this is still a really big agreement. Now there's momentum picking up over these over this peace deal. The very first flyover from Israel and Germany just took place not a couple days ago. They're talking about Jared Kushner. Donald Trump's son-in-law is now saying that it's almost a guaranteed thing that there'll be peace in the Middle East. And um, that's a huge thing. Huge thing. Before the temple can ever, the third temple can ever be built, there has to be peace talks first. And I believe that the peace talks will initiate the Great Tribulation period, that seven years of tribulation. I'll get into further details if I make a video on all of this. But this is very important. We're seeing peace talks now happening all over Israel. And once again, if they do get peace, they're really truly wanting to build their temple because they don't believe that their Messiah can come to the earth until the temple is built. 
Since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house that my name might be therein, but I chose David to be over my people Israel. He's quoting what God said. And it was in the heart of David, my father, to build a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And the Lord said unto David, my father, whereas it was in thine heart to build a house unto my name, thou didst well that it was in thine heart. Nevertheless, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son that shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house unto my name. Now Solomon, he knew about this prophecy. And the Lord actually tells David, his name will be Solomon. And now we see Solomon fulfilling that prophecy. And the Lord hath performed his word that he spake, and I am risen up in the room of David my father, and sit on the throne of Israel, as the Lord promised, and have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And I have set there a place for the ark, wherein is the covenant of the Lord which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now one thing that must be noted is he's once again, this is a common reminder to them whenever a prophet or a priest or a, a, a really great king stands up and proclaims anything of any true heavenly significance to the people they always are reminded god brought you out of slavery god brought you out of egypt which is like us the our christian um our christian life how we were brought out of bondage to sin and death and hell and the grave and how we sought that darkness but now we're brought into the light and it's the lord that does it it's a it's a good thing to be reminded of as christians but one must also understand how it's about 500 years from the time that they were brought out of egypt to this day this is a huge just a momentous day for israel because whenever they had the tabernacle in the wilderness the people also dwelt in tents so the lord dwelt in tents with them which was the tabernacle now we see an, a, a magnificent sturdy very great foundation laid house for the lord and this is a showing of how the people now have security and their own sovereignty and finally they have come into their home and are truly settled and solomon stood before the altar of the lord in the presence of all the congregation of israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven this was a common way of prayer back then many people still do it but notice right here it says that he stood before the altar and spread forth his hands toward heaven. We'll see how this prayer, and to which I'm going to just go ahead and read a lot of it. It takes up a lot of the chapter. But how this prayer, he winds up, he's standing at first, but somewhere during it, he winds up on, on his knees praying. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee. In heaven above or on earth beneath, who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. This really struck me while reading it. He says, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above. Paul the Apostle, whenever he seen heaven, it was, he couldn't describe it. It was indescribable. And Paul, he had a, he had a really good way with words. He knew we assume he knew Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, may have known other languages as well. He's a genius, but he could not describe what he's seen when he's seen the third heaven, which is God's home, the ultimate heaven. He couldn't describe what he's seen, but we read right here, there is no God like thee in heaven above. So God, even though heaven is just so magnificent, so glorious, and so unspeakably magnificent, God himself is even above that. There's no one like God. There's no one like God who has kept with thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him. Thou spakest also with thy mouth and hast fulfilled it with thine hand as it is this day. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep thy servant David, my father, that thou promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that thy children take heed to their way that they walk, may walk before me as thou hast walked before me. So he's talking about how David, how, the, how David walked before the Lord. That's what he desires of David's children, including Solomon himself. 
but we will see, Lord willing, Saturday's Bible study, or rather it'll be Sunday to you all, but the Bible study Saturday will see the summation <laughs> of Solomon's life and how his reign and how he did not walk before the Lord like his father David. Right here, he's in good standing with the Lord. But he winds up getting way off track. We'll come to that. And now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified, which thou spakest unto thy servant David, my father. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have builded. So now we're getting more clarification on what he said earlier. Earlier he said, Lord, I have built you a house so that you may dwell in. But now he says... The heaven of heavens cannot contain God, how much less the house that I've built. So Solomon is well aware that God, this is not a literal house where God is going to stay in. He's not confined to this. God is everywhere. Yet have thou respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today that thine eyes may be opened toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place, and hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. This tells us a little bit about how the majority of the prayers prayed unto God are from broken sinners because what they're asking for is forgiveness and Solomon makes note of this but also before we go any further we read about when they shall pray toward this place meaning that the Israelites would pray towards the house the uh, many of the Jews today keep that tradition if any man trespass against his neighbor and an oath be laid upon him to cause him to swear in the oath, come before thine altar in this house, then hear thou in heaven and do, and judge thy servants, condemning the wicked to bring his way upon his head and justifying the righteous to give him according to his righteousness. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee in this house, then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again into the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. So he's speaking about even a people far off, the captive of maybe whatever war or whatever that they have to go through. He says, even hear them when they're not around the temple or the outer court or, or any of this place, not even in Israel. Hear them then. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin when thou afflictest them. Now whenever it's talking about when heaven is shut up, that means that it just doesn't rain. Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy servants and of the, thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. Many, many deaths back then happened if there was a famine, if there was a, you know, uh, no rain, no food, no life. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting mildew, locust, or if there be caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man, <clears throat> or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart, pay attention to that, the plague of his own heart, and spread forth his hands toward this house. So there's a plague of the heart, meaning that there's something that ails a man, just like a black plague or whatever, any kind of virus, disease, whatever. Just like that, out in the open, there's also that can, they can be inward, soulful, spiritual, whatever. They can be unseen by the eye. The man may be physically healthy, but there's a plague within him that's eating him alive. Something is afflicting him. Much like Saul, King Saul, how the spirit was vexing him. Charles Spurgeon, he had good commentary on this. A great many men think they know the plague of other people's hearts. 
and there is a great deal of talk in the world about this family and that person and the other, I pray you let the scandals of the hour alone and think of your own evils. I have seen so many preachers stand up and just condemn, condemn, condemn. Everybody's a wicked, wicked, hell-bound sinner except him. He never thinks of himself as, as a sinner. Everyone else is horrible, but he's up there and he's the one speaking, so he must be perfect in all ways. Think of your own evils. Isn't there enough trouble in your own life that you don't have to go and you know, budge in on Joe Blows down the street? Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and do and give to every man according to his ways whose heart thou knowest for thou even thou only knowest the hearts of all the children of men thou only angels don't know your heart satan doesn't know your heart no one in your family knows your heart only god does and he knows it perfectly that they may fear thee all the days that they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers Moreover, concerning a stranger, now pay attention, that is not of thy people Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake. For they shall hear of thy great name, and of thy strong hand, and of thy stretched out arm, when he shall come and pray toward this house. You see now the spot of the temple. There was a place called the court of the Gentiles, which would have been the outer court, and it is where the Gentiles can come to pray. And the further that one would have gotten into the temple, the less people were allowed near it. Solomon himself, he is not praying this prayer in the temple. Only the priests were allowed to actually go in the temple. And in the Holy of Holies, only once a year was one priest, the high priest, allowed to go in. So everyone had a place to pray. So Solomon goes on to talk about the gentiles hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for that all people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee as do thy people israel and that they may know that this house which i have built is called by thy name joseph benson had great commentary on this he said about this referring to the gentiles he says it is observable that Solomon's prayer for the stranger is more large and comprehensive than for the Israelites, that thereby he might encourage strangers to the worship of the true God. Thus, early were the indications of God's favor toward the sinners of the Gentiles. That's a great point. Early on, we see that it's not just in the New Testament that we start to see, well, you know, God actually might care about us Gentiles. It was way before Paul the Apostle and before Christ talking to the Roman centurion. And it was way before any of that that we see God's favor towards the Gentiles. I've spoke about this in many Bible studies before. If thy people go out to battle against their enemy whithersoever they shall send them, and shall pray unto the Lord toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house that I have built for thy name, then hear thou in heaven their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause. If they sin against thee, now listen to this, for there is no man that sinneth not. Solomon made sure to add that. That shows that everyone should be praying to God. Everyone. And thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy, far or near. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land, whither they were carried captives, and repent, and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned, and have done perversely, we have committed wickedness. And so return unto thee with all their heart, and with all their soul, and the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto <clears throat> their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. I really do like the situation that Solomon is putting sinners in. He says, even if they are in the land of their enemies. I remember I found myself so often buying drugs from you know, some guy that I hardly even knew. And I would wind up in so many places where I was just like, what am I doing? How did I even get here? What? And it's that, it's that moment of, 
a little bit of clarity where you're like, this is so stupid. What? I mean, how insane am I to wind up in this spot watching out for cops out the window and with these people and them are all crazy and I'm one of the craziest of them. But this tells us that even in all of that, at any moment, no matter where you are, you can say, God, I'm sorry, forgive me. Get me out of this and I'll never, ever come back in. Really mean it. Like, I know, I know that a lot of people say that, but, and it's a joke to the world whenever they reference prayers like that. But to really mean it, God will deliver you from that. He wants us all to be on the right path. He desires all to come into repentance and no, and none to perish. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. You see how God can make peace between even the worst situations? I, this has happened in my life numerous times. I'd be in a very tense, anxiety riddled part of my life, very dire, not knowing how to get out of it. And God just makes a way, like a clear path. It's just, it's wonderful whenever that happens. And God can do that at any time if it's according to his will. For they be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron, that thine eyes may be open unto the supplication of thy servant and unto the supplication of thy people Israel, to hearken unto them and all that they call for unto thee. For thou didst separate them from among all the people of the earth to be thine inheritance, as thou spakest by the hand of Moses thy servant when thou broughtest our fathers out of Egypt, O Lord God. Many so-called Christians have a hatred for the Jewish people, for the Israelites. <clears throat> they have a stern hatred for them. And we have to realize that God, he used Israel for his vessel. Dave Hunt used to say this all the time. He used to say, if you want proof of God, just look at the nation of Israel. David Guzik said it best, I believe. Blessing to Israel wasn't meant to end with Israel. God wanted to bless the world through Israel. God came through Israel. He came through Jews. So there's a little bit of envy, I believe, on the part of a lot of so-called Christians. But you have to understand about Israel as it is a witness unto God. Now, that's not saying that they go out and that there's a bunch of great Christian preachers coming out of Israel. They don't do that. There's not. There's a few Messianic preachers that they're Messianic Jews. They believe in Christ. They're Jews. But there's not very many. They're very few and far between. But I really like this. Israel, the only nation on earth that lives in the same land with the same name and the same capital city, speaking the same language and worshiping the same God that it did 3,000 years ago. Now, a lot of people are going to be concerned with that last, <laughs> that last word right there because they rejected God and Christ. But they did serve the true God back in the study that we're talking about right now. And there were many that believed on Jesus when Jesus was preaching in Israel. Remember the disciples and all them that would follow him? But the history of Israel is just so bizarrely fascinating. These people should have been, by all earthly standards, they should have been annihilated time after time after time these are one could argue the most hated people ever and yet they have maintained a spot of land that is today no bigger than new jersey and they are utterly surrounded by enemies and on all sides they're surrounded And yet they, they persist, and it's because of God. If you don't see that, if you don't believe that there's a God, just look at this nation of Israel that still stands to this day. 
And it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication unto the Lord, he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. So we see right there how Solomon went from standing with his hands up to he was kneeling at the end. God, the more that you speak to him, has this humbling effect on uh, people. And he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. One can just picture this. It's King Solomon up there, and this cloud is coming out of the temple, this magnificent sight. And, I mean, it's just packed. Uh, you know, Super Bowl kind of packed. And the king yelling over all the people. And to be as majestic, one might say, that uh, as Solomon was, we'll, figure, we'll find out in the next few uh, studies leading up to Saturday how, man, he just, he had it all. Even Jesus refers to the glory of Solomon and um, and such. But even being arguably the richest man ever, having everything that the world could offer you and wisdom on top of that, having all of that, he winds up at the end of his life in the book of Ecclesiastes referring to himself as the preacher. It's almost like you, he just seen how the way, and you can read the book of Ecclesiastes for yourself and see that all the, all that this world offered meant nothing, but, preaching he wanted to be known as the preacher at the end not as this great you know notorious king infamous in some ways but a preacher i remember dale moody real quick i remember dale moody saying about someone asked dale moody one of the best preachers of our time he said someone came up and they asked him why don't you run for president moody and he said, what, take a demotion? You know, I believe that preaching is the best calling that anyone could ever have. Getting paid for it or not, it doesn't matter. Preach the gospel. And uh, you'll be rewarded for it. Maybe not down here, but uh, you will one day. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments which he commanded our fathers. And let these words wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night that he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel at all times as the matter shall require. That all the people of the earth, listen to that, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is none else. Not just Israel, all the people. And Jesus even says, he says to his disciples, he, uh, one of the prophecies, and this gospel shall be spread throughout all the earth as a witness that this book is true. My words are true, that I am the Lord. And sure enough, the most famous book in the world is the Bible. And the biggest news in the world is that Jesus saves. That is it. So further proof that, that all the people of the earth, man, that just that gives me cold chills. I love that. Let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. I really do like what Solomon says right there. He says, just like on this day, may you walk the rest of your lives. Basically, that's the implication. And I've, I've felt that way about leaving church sometimes. I'd be so uplifted from the, the worship and the preaching and the sermon. I mean, just felt so good. And I would think, man, if I could just have this feeling the rest of my life, you know. But then you get back out into the world. And the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered unto the Lord. Two and twenty thousand oxen, twenty-two thousand oxen, and a hundred and twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated to the house of the Lord. 
The same day did the king hollow the middle of the court that was before the house of the Lord, for there he offered burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings, because the brazen altar that was before the Lord was too little to receive the burnt offerings and meat offerings and the fat of the peace offerings. So they had to extend this altar. And at that time Solomon held a feast, and all Israel with him, a great congregation from the entering gate of Hamath unto the river of Egypt, before the Lord our God, seven days and seven days, even fourteen days. The usual uh, ceremony for the Feast of Tabernacles would have lasted a week. This lasted two weeks. The amount of sacrifices, see, because with a sacrifice, you give the fat, which is known as the best part, unto the Lord. You burn that up and give it to the Lord. And then you take some of the meat, and the priest takes some of the meat, and you, we all, all share in it. It's not just, you know, God getting a sacrifice. It's everybody. It's like it's a family thing. And um, this was enough sacrifice, the meat coming from it, for the people. It was enough to last them two weeks. That is quite a lot of meat, let me tell you. On the eighth day, he sent the people away. And they blessed the king and went into their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had done for David his servant and for Israel his people. And just once again, going right back to church, don't you feel like that quite often coming from church? You know, joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord has done unto you and your family. Isn't it great? But also, notice how he mentions David his servant and for Israel his people. See, because the plans for the temple began with David, the father of Solomon. It, they, this all began with David. He, he had it in his heart to build the temple. But it was for Solomon to build it as a king of peace. Now, this was a great time for Solomon. If Solomon would have maintained this heart towards God the remainder of his reign no telling how great that things would have been for the nation of Israel but because of what Solomon does and I mean it is bad we're going to get into that it is very very horrible what Solomon does but we'll come to that here in the next day or two until then hope that y'all learned something this was a very long chapter the other ones are not this long so I'm not going to spend any more time on it. So I thank you all for joining me. I hope that you learned something. Lord of all peace and love and mercy be with you. Amen.